Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Ed Wasserman, Dean of the Graduate School of Journalism. It's my honor and my pleasure to welcome you here tonight uh, after a lustrous Berkeley afternoon. It's a beautiful evening. Uh, this event is being recorded, so if you have cell phones, please turn them off. Uh, if you need help figuring out how to turn them off, we have a lot of communication specialists in the house. We'll do that. We'll, we'll send somebody over there. Um, welcome to the third annual Esther Wojcicki Lectureship. This was created in 2017 uh, through a generous gift from Tad Toby via Toby Philanthropies, uh, represented here tonight by ex Executive Director Shana Penn, who I'm going to ask to stand up in a minute, who's also a new member of our advisory board. The lectureship honors a renowned journalism educator, Esther Wojcicki. Uh, she's an alum of the Graduate School of Journalism and a member of our advisory board and a dear friend. Uh, Esther, uh, I will offer a very, very brief summary of her, uh, of her biography and accomplishments. Uh, she, among uh, a number of other things, is the founder of an innovative and unique uh, journalism, uh, journalism program at Palo Alto High School. If any of you have ever seen the Center of Journalism and Media Studies at Palo Alto High School, it puts what we have here at UC Berkeley to shame. Uh, she has hundreds of students going through there, and, and, and a number of them have gone on to very illustrious careers. Uh, she has pioneered uh, a move toward making journalism education widely acceptable, uh, accessible, uh, and she has inspired us to do some things I'm going to talk about in one second. Um, she also, in her own right, has written books on education, and in her spare time has written a book uh, talking about her success as a mother, um, where, it, it, as it happens, uh, she, uh, uh, among her daughters, is the CEO of uh, YouTube and the founder of 23andMe, a genomic testing company uh, service, and, uh, a, uh, and another daughter who is merely an accomplished uh, uh, physician at UCSF. Uh, her latest book talks about that. Uh, she travels and lectures uh, all over the world. Uh, I've learned from her. Uh, she's in hot demand as a force for the kind of civic education journalism that I think we dearly and desperately need. So um, I want to uh, ask Esther to stand and be recognized. Uh, she's a great friend, of please. And th thanks to her. Um, Some of you have heard the story of how Tad Toby, who's a, a, a very, very successful entrepreneur uh, in the real estate space, uh, learned through 23andMe that Esther was a cousin of his, a distant cousin of his, and they got to be very good friends, and he decided three years ago that he wanted to do something uh, special, something to honor her, and she suggested a lecture series uh, focused on technology here at the Journalism School. So. Um, I, uh, while we're recognizing people, we have other members of the board, uh, the advisory board of the Graduate School of Journalism here. I would like them to stand uh, with Shana Penn, who's a member, uh, Bob Bishop. Any other members here who want to please stand to be recognized? They're very important to us, very important to what we do. This is a particularly interesting, innovative, and vigorous time at the school. We're embarked on two very different uh, initiatives. One is thanks to our good fortune to bring in some amazing journalists to head up our investigative reporting program, uh, which has been around since, since 2006. We now have uh, David Barstow and Gita Anand, who between the two of them have five Pulitzer Prizes running the IRP, and they have announced, and an, an, with, with our encouragement, a very, very ambitious plan and to integrate investigative journalism throughout the curriculum of the school and to have that characterized to be the emblem of what makes Berkeley journalism unique among journalism training academies. So on the one hand, we have the IRP. On the other hand, we are moving very hard to try to reintroduce journalism training for undergraduates at Berkeley, something that's been gone for about 40 years. And we feel very strongly that anybody graduating with a bachelor's degree from any university in this country should have a basic understanding of how to use these things ethically and effectively to tell stories, to describe the world around them, to link up with like-minded people, and to uh, behave, uh, to, to basically move the quality of topical information, the quality of social awareness in a positive direction. So we're moving very hard to create opportunities for Berkeley undergraduates to learn 
uh, how to use their uh, how to use digital communications in a socially beneficial way. Uh, so there's two initiatives we have in our way. I want to acknowledge while we're at it, uh, two new senior people at the school, uh, the school's administrative staff. We have a new director of students, senior director of student services, Tracy Pasquadi. Would you stand to be recognized? An assistant dean for advancement. A new assistant dean for advancement whose job is to keep the wolf from our door and to continue the, the vast rivers of money that, that uh, sometimes don't altogether materialize to keep us going. Uh, Jeff Rohde. Now the focus of the week-long Wojcicki lectureships is the tech sector and the challenge that tech in all its complexity and immense consequence poses to contemporary journalism. Previous lecturers were Kara Swisher and John Markoff, both pioneering American journalists who created tech coverage for the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and other startups they themselves founded. Our guest tonight and the 2020 Wojcicki lecturer is Carol Cadwallader, a reporter with The Guardian and Observer in the UK. As The Atlantic Magazine wrote in a profile of Carol last year, she may be among the most consequential reporters of her age changing the way we talk about Facebook with the revelations of how Cambridge Analytica was mass harvesting data to influence elections. It's a great story behind the story, the reporter who spends a year convincing a consultant to turn whistleblower and reveals one of the most stunning cases of political manipulation of the digital era about a British consulting firm, Cambridge Analytica, that hijacked data from a staggering 50 million Facebook accounts to try to influence both the 2016 US presidential election and the UK Brexit vote. This unprecedented assault on personal privacy triggered congressional hearings and fed, and fed growing public mistrust in the tech sector. It also became the subject of the film, The Great Hack, which I recommend to you is available on Netflix, as is, uh, I also recommend Carol's 15-minute TED Talk in 2019, titled Facebook's Role in Brexit and the Threat to Democracy, which he delivered to the founders of Facebook and Google and the co-founder of Twitter. Carol herself grew up in Wales, was educated at Oxford. Alongside her illustrious success as a journalist, she's a successful novelist, which I only learned by reading Wikipedia. She keeps many of her lights under a bushel. Her first book, The Family Tree, in 2006, was rapturously received, widely translated, and made into a five-part serial on BBC Radio 4. Uh, this is a particularly auspicious moment to talk about the possibility of the next great hack and what Carol has called plastic populism, political figures supported by a minority of constituents and propped up by dark money. Carol's interlocutor tonight is one of our own, award-winning journalist and professor of journalism and English, Mark Danner. He has written for three decades on foreign affairs and international conflict. He's just recently back from a Guggenheim in which he's doing, uh, uh, which he spent preparing a biography of Robert Silver, the founder of New York Review of Books. He's taught at Berkeley Journalism for more than 20 years. Mark will be on leave in the fall under assignment from the New York Review to cover the 2016 election. Uh, he is an amazing on-stage talent. We're very happy. Oh, man. That's right. 2016 would have been a little bit, a little bit easier, right? So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Carol and Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Thanks very much. And thank you, Esther, for this moment. Um, let me gather a little reporting information here for a second. How many, maybe you can clap, tell me how many are following the uh, presidential campaign? <laughs> how many are following the Democratic primaries? <clears throat> how many think this is an important election? Well, I've got some, some good news for you and some bad news. And the bad news is you have no idea what's going on, which is to say that there are plot lines here buried beneath the surface uh, that I would say most of the mainstream media is not getting at and that have to do with a new kind of vulnerability and frailty to the entire liberal democratic system. The good news is that there is absolutely no better place on the entire planet Earth than you can be tonight than right here. Because this is the person who has done 
Carol Cadwallader, more reporting on this problem and this phenomenon, both on the ground reporting uh, as a feature writer for the, the Observer and an investigatory writer for the Observer, um, but also uh, something I prize, thinking about this in the broader context of what it means for our democracy, what it means for liberal democracy, what it means for what she calls uh, plastic authoritarianism, and what it means for the kind of transformation that seems to be going on all around us from a world in which we seem to be able to hang on to something that was quaintly called truth to a world of propaganda, lies, misrepresentations, uh, and dark money. And I'm hoping that we can start with what is going on now, what we're not seeing, um, and we can go back to the story that you've probably heard about a good deal and is most associated with Carol's name, which is uh, uh, Cambridge Analytica. And then we can go forward a little bit to the implications uh, for where we live, not only the country we live in, but Silicon Valley, because indeed, as Ed mentioned, uh, Carol gave a very uh, popular, uh, I guess I should say, TED Talk in which she addressed and challenged directly the gods of tech and essentially said, uh, gods of tech, liberal democracy is broken and you have broken it. And so far as I know up to now, they have not answered and they have not fixed it. So I'm going to begin by asking you how indeed liberal democracy is broken and how you came to that conclusion. Well, I think that's where, like, Britain is the warning for history, really. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it was, that has been sort of one of the propelling things over three years, which, you know, um, forced me to sort of keep on going. And, you know, we had an election that we know was seriously problematic, that had multiple illegalities um, committed in it that was funded by money that we don't know where it came from. And, um, you know... You're talking about Brexit. Right? Talking about mm -hmm. Brexit. And, you know, that was a one-off election. That was a one-off election that has changed the course of British history. And it, that was entirely facilitated by the tech platforms and specifically Facebook. And it is, you know, it is, it's just, it's very, it, it, the interesting thing about Britain is it's easier to see what's going on than it is in America. And that's because, you know, we're much smaller and far less money is spent in our elections. And we have these very controlled laws about what could be spent. And the tech platforms completely disrupted this 100 years of legislation that had been established to keep our elections free and fair. And, you know, in the court space of four years, essentially, that was completely destroyed. And any amount of money uh, could be spent online in political campaigning with absolutely no oversight mm -hmm. and no awareness of what that money was spent on, what the ads were which people were shown. And, you know, it's had this amazing consequential effect. And we're still, you know, we, we, there is, there's been a lot of investigation. We found out a lot of what's gone on. But it's still shrouded in darkness in the sense that it, Facebook is a private company and it just hasn't released the information. And, um, and it sort of amazes me that, you know, here you are, you're plunging into this new election, 2020, and essentially it's being treated as it is just another election, but everything has changed. And you, you know, the answers about what happened in 2016, you haven't even begun to scratch the surface there. And the, the entire forensic evidence of what happened in 2016 is locked away inside Facebook servers. And nothing actually has been done to get hold of that evidence. And, um, 
Uh, and uh, meanwhile, you know, as I say, it's onwards into the next election. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I, I kind of, my, my thing about it is, is that the, the tech companies are desperate. Facebook is desperate to like, not address the past and to talk about what it's doing in the future. But actually, unless we get to the truth of what happened, I think, in these absolutely fundamental, pivotal elections, we've got no means of safeguarding the future. And, um, um, you know, it's just a very basic thing of our elections should not be being conducted inside private companies where we just don't have the access, the mm -hmm. proper access to this data and information. You and I, that was a bit long-winded, sorry. But. You and I were talking about this beforehand and talking about the various currents, that this is a complex story. And on the one hand, the things that were familiar to me as a reporter, which is PSYOPs, which is psychological operations to alter public opinion, combined with unlimited dark money that is no limitations anymore on this side of the Atlantic or the other, how much money is being pumped in or where it's coming from, and finally, the tech platforms. So those three things really coming together. Can you talk about specifically how those altered uh, Brexit? Like the, for people who don't know how that technique was used, the idea of the persuadables, how you basically stole the election is what it comes down to. Well, it's just, I mean, there's, there's so many parts of it. And, you know, I'm really glad that you brought up the PSYOPs part. So, you know, it's because there is, you know, this lens of looking at what happened. Is it, so for, in, for, for, a, for a year, more than a year before we published the story of Chris Wiley, the whistleblower, I'd been writing about Cambridge Analytica. And throughout that time, there was a lot of pushback, particularly from tech reporters, particularly from American tech reporters, about how, oh, it's, they all do that. It's just like, it's just, you know, it's like they, they all do fancy things with data, and it doesn't even work. It's snake oil. And, you know, throughout that time, it was this thing of saying, you know, well, you know, Cambridge Analytica, it wasn't just a fancy data company. It actually was part of a British defence contractor. So for 30 years, it had been operating in war zones and, you know, paid for by our Ministry of Defence, paid for by your Department of Defence. You know, that, that money, the taxpayers' money, had gone to, you know, developing the skills and expertise. And, you know, the fact that then that got targeted at a civilian population that actually paid for it is, you know, one aspect of this story that is still, I think, very hidden and not understood. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's so, you know, the propaganda that is used in warfare on enemy populations is a very different idea of, you know, persuasion <coughs> politics mm -hmm. that we've been used to. And I think that's actually a really useful way of thinking about what's coming in 2020, because it's, you know, you don't know the, the way that, you know, propaganda is used on, I say, as I say, enemy populations, that it's done sort of in darkness. You don't know how people are being selected and targeted. And that is, you know, exactly the same as what is happening now, whilst the Democratic Party mm -hmm. is arguing over which candidate to have. You know, the population is being profiled, you know, based upon this vast amount of data that is available about you that is just for sale, but you have no idea what that is or where it's come from. I mean, so, it's a sort of, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's it, you know, it is chilling. And I think that in the in the day-to-day sort of horse race politics, you know, that you see mm -hmm. on TV in, in America, uh, there is something darker, more chilling, more dystopian that is going on beneath the surface, as you say. So there's a really a selection process that goes on. If we were going to apply it to the United States, we would say there are a certain number of states that are in play. Yeah. We concentrate on those. And within those states, there are a certain number of people who I, we identify as being in play, and we call them the persuadables. And then we do what we can to target them 
with uh, sculpted appeals that uh, are designed to make them change their mind using usually fear and hatred. Was, is that last part accurate, would you say? Yeah, I mean, it's sort of... I mean, one of the easy, the, the, you know, one of the, the sort of tricks that's been learnt, which is to, the, to get an emotional reaction from people. And the easiest emotional reaction to get from people is to scare them. Mm-hmm. And, and that, you know, absolutely was the sort of motivating thing in Brexit. It was scaring people about immigrants. And the, scaring, US, the U.S. election, scaring too. Scaring people about Muslims. Mm-hmm. And that was the, the driving force. And, but it's not, it's not just about... I mean, the persuadables, it's not just about getting people to vote for your guy, of course. It's also suppressing the other side's votes. And that's, you know, this is kind of like one of the things which amazes me, again, that, sort of, that is, feels very undercovered and um, is the fact that, you know... Facebook facilitated racism. You know, it facilitated the suppression of black and Latin votes. And I feel like that is a scandal. How did it, could you be specific? How did it do that? Yet to be told. Mm. Well, we don't know. We mean, we, the, this is part of it. I mean, the, so for example, there's a couple, there's very few adverts. So the, Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of adverts that were shown to voters in the 2016 election, they're gone. You know, they had, nobody's got those out of Facebook. But there's a few that we have seen. And there's things like, you know, there were, there were adverts like um, in Spanish saying, um, don't have time to vote today. Text 5045 to vote Hillary. Mm-hmm. And, you know... It's sort of, um, you know, it, it, it is just astonishing, really, that um, they got away with it. You would call this an intelligence active measures, right? Actually acting to make people uh, do things in particular ways, which is to say not to vote, for example. The other, I know the ad, one of the ads that you showed, um, which was key in Brexit, was this targeted advertisement that said Turkey is about to join the EU. And it had these great... Uh, maps with 75 million Turks basically headed for Britain. Uh, And of course, this is is false. It's not true. But they were targeted particularly to people who were analyzed as being open to this kind of a fearful uh, message. So the idea was either don't vote, vote against, uh, you know, highly, highly sophisticated, depending on a vast amount of data which is something else I think uh, I wanted to ask you about. Uh, can you give us a sense of the magnitude of the data when it comes to uh, the use by Cambridge Analytica in the United States and where all of that actually came from? I mean, we've had Zuckerberg apologizing and so on, but how did they actually get it? So they got it by, they got it by seeding a viral questionnaire. So essentially, they paid sort of a couple of hundred thousand people to take a personality questionnaire. And when they filled out the questionnaire, they had to use a Facebook sign-in. And that automatically gave the consent for the psychologist to to get not just all of their information, so everything on their Facebook profile, everything they'd ever liked, and even private messages, actually. But it also gave permission for the, all of their friends as well. So that was the thing of like, you know, you had no idea that your Facebook data had been scooped up. So what was the magnitude of... of so that was Demet- 87 million Facebook confessed to in the end. We thought it was 50 million. And um, yeah, they later said that actually it was 87 million. And how many actually... What is the magnitude of targeted ads insofar as we know it now in that election from the Trump campaign on Facebook? How do you mean? Um, In other words, how many... There have been a lot of different numbers about uh, uh, the order of magnitude of ads that were actually sent around on Facebook targeted by the Trump campaign using Cambridge Analytica. I'm wondering if you'd give us... Well, an I idea mean, of there's that. still, there's still, there's, there's, I mean, it goes back to this thing: is that there's still so much we don't know. So the mm. role, actually, of Cambridge Analytica in the 2016 election is still unknown. 
I mm. mean, the um, you know, it's just like one of multiple multiple questions that we don't know about. I mean, one of the really um, the really key questions um, that I was on a panel in September with um, um, Adam Schiff, mm -hmm. and you know, he was the chair of the it's House, House Intelligence Committee. Okay. And he said this thing, and I was so, like, delighted to hear somebody say it who was, you know, in a position of authority. But he said, you know, the whole thing is, is that if there was collusion between the Trump campaign and the Kremlin, then the place to look for it, the place they wanted to look for it on the committee was in the data flows on Facebook. And it was because... If you could see this overlap in targeting of who the Trump campaign was targeting and who the Kremlin was targeting, mm -hmm. then that in that Venn diagram would be your evidence of collusion. And he said they hadn't been able to get that information out of Facebook. And he, you know, it was what they you know, were hoping to see in the Mueller report. And there was nothing about that in the Mueller report. Why well, can't... And, and it, you yeah. know, it just goes... But as I say, it goes back to this, for me, this sort of, like, really, really fundamental issue of you don't even have the evidence yet of, you know, the, the, of the, you know to even look for, for, for um, the, 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 you know, the crimes that were committed, the subversion that happened in the 2016 mm -hmm. election. Why is there no uh, willingness to actually aggressively subpoena information like that in your analysis. I mean, the politics of this, I think everybody in this room can feel that the politics of it are slowly changing. That is, uh, big tech is no longer the hero of our lives. They've taken a lot of hits in the last couple of years since the 2016 election, certainly, and since Brexit. On the other hand, there's a kind of moment of stasis. I mean, you called it in your TED Talk an inflection point, which is, you know, an optimistic way to put it. One could also say that we, we don't know what to do. That is, the political system is paralyzed. I mean, are you optimistic that actually... No, I, I mean, I think that, I mean, one of the key things, I think, is that politicians have not grasped the, 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 the gravity of the situation. I think that's, fun, you know, abundantly clear. And I think that politics essentially is carrying on as normal as before, as if the old rules still apply and they don't apply. You know, this, this, the, the whole the, the thing is, it, this is, you know, it's a system change that has occurred. It's that things, you know, the, it, the destabilization of truth, the attacks on facts and evidence, combined with this machinery that is fueled by this vast, vast, vast amounts of information that's been gathered upon you, all, which we have no conception of, really. You've got no conception of, the, of, of you know, the fact that there is a shadow profile that exists of you, that is, you know, uh, hundreds of companies have access to, and political campaigns. And... Mm. You know, I, I just don't think it is business as normal. Mm -hmm. And, um, um, you know, and people are worried about this. So we're, you know, we're all worried and we're all concerned, I think, about the fact that Facebook has decided to allow politicians to spread lies in paid advertisements. There seems to be no possible good reason why that should be the case. But it is the case, and it's the case right now in America as you go into this crucial election. Let me, let me push back just a little bit to get more uh, specific, which is, you know, one could sit out there and say, well, there's always been propaganda. It's been this huge business uh, around the world in the United States, Bernays, you know, you could point to history of propaganda, the dark arts of persuasion. Arguably, it's an American uh, innovation. Um, what is it? Obviously, the magnitudes here are much bigger. Is it because they know us? That is, is it because the data comes from us and is thus uniquely impactful? It's uniquely effective. Is that what's different? I think it's both. It's both. It's both kind of in and out. Because at the same time, the devices that we all use all of the time 
you know, generate just this vast, vast trove of information, some of which is, in, you know, in, as I say, inaccurate. These profiles are built. We have no idea what they are, but they affect all of our abilities to, like, get a loan or health insurance or a mortgage. Mm -hmm. You know, that we have no access to this information that they have on us in this way. And then, it, then it's also the delivery device, these same, these same devices that we're addicted to, you know, that we check, um, you know, however many times a day. They, mm -hmm. they, they, they nudge us and move us and, um, in new ways that mm. we feel slightly helpless um, about, I think. So I think it's both, it's both sort of input and output. And it's, you know, I'd add something to that, which is that it pretends to be something else. You know, Carol did this astonishing piece that I will, I recommend everybody uh, read, in which she began by putting in uh, to Google, Jews are. And are Jews. Are, I'm sorry, are Jews, excuse me. And was it the first thing that came up, e evil? Yeah. Evil. So you have this idea that these search engines are, you're looking at an objective world that's being searched, but of course there's nothing objective about it. Could you talk about that a little bit, the, the whole idea of objectivity and, and that uh, are Jews, are women, all of those searches well, you did? Well, this was, this was how I kind of fell down the rabbit hole of, of looking into this subject. And I do still, it was, it was about a week after Trump got elected and just started looking at the, the, the you know, the, the subject of fake news had just suddenly hit the headlines. And... Um, you know, Trump had just been elected. It was this sort of horrible November night. And I just started looking at Google search. And I was trying to figure out how it worked. I was sort of confused. And I, just, and I thought, well, I'll try out some different searches. And so I put in Jews. And then I thought, oh, you have to make it into a question with Google. So I put, are Jews. And Google has this auto-suggestion thing. And it gives you a list of suggestions of what they think you're looking for, to anticipate what you're looking for. And the first suggestion was, are Jews evil? And I was, you know, kind of confused. And I just, you know, I hit return. And the, I had this entire page of results, which were tiny uh, websites I'd never heard of. And, you know, when I looked at them and clicked through, every single one was an anti-Semitic hate site that said, yes, Jews are evil. And I was just really confused. And then at the bottom of the page, it said, you know, it suggests what you want to look for next. And the suggestion was, did the Holocaust happen? <laughs> and so I clicked on, did the Holocaust happen? And the top result was Stormfront, which is a Nazi website. And it said, no, the Holocaust didn't happen. And I had a whole page of results, every single one of which said, no, the Holocaust didn't happen. And then the suggestions of what to search for next is the Holocaust is a lie, the Holocaust is a hoax. And it was just this, you know, I go back to it a lot because it's sort of this sort of sickening feeling of what on earth am I looking at and how long has this been out there? Here for how many people have seen this? You know how, how you know it, it was this idea that th that these results had been out there because it wasn't the thing is about. It, I thought it's a one-off. It's just me. Is it my browser? And you know, so I was trying it on a different browser and on my phone. And then I tried all sorts of different search terms. So I was like, oh, what do they say about women? And I put are women, and I got exactly the same one. Are women evil? And there is this thing on Google, when, when they're really sure of the results, the results go in a box at the top, a knowledge box. And with the women one, it said, it was in a box, and it said, yes, all women are evil because every woman has a small degree of prostitute inside her. So, <laughs> now, let me ask you, um, you obviously investigated this, is it, one is trained to think here that you know your filters are uh, built up by you according to your searches, yeah. right? Yeah. Why why did these results come up in the way they did? Well, what's really interesting about this is that you know we still don't know the answer to that, and um, the the thing is it it was 
you know, something had happened essentially on the internet that had interrupted Google's normal search results that had mm. somehow gained the algorithm. You know, like SEO, you know, like get your brand of shampoo up the search results. But it, it was like that on a global scale with all of these sort of trigger topics. And that is not accidental. You know, and, and I, I discovered, I, you know, I was very, a couple of days later, this um, researcher called Jonathan Albright, and he had mm -hmm. just started looking at the network of fake news sites. And he sort of, he, he sort of you know, did this sort of network map, map. Anyway, when I spoke to him, we were both completely freaked out. So it was this... You know, he was sort of he was sort of saying, oh, you know, people are talking about fake news as if it's articles. And he said, it's actually it's a system. And he said, you can see it kind of like a cancer which has taken over the Internet and it's suffocating the normal, the mainstream news sites. You can sort of see like The Guardian and The New York Times sort of being surrounded by it in a way. And, you know, it took. The whole thing was about it is that it was, this was my sort of lesson. And I, I sort of had this naive idea that it, if you, you know, you discovered something terrible, you wrote about it in the newspaper, people were completely horrified and then something would be done. And it was my sort of, you know, first lesson. And actually, it doesn't work like that. And you have to keep on going and keeping on writing about it. But I think the thing was that Google didn't know how to fix the problem. This is what this is what sort of came out. They didn't understand what was going on on their platform. And it took them three months to, to solve this. And they had to do a complete algorithmic update. So that question of actually who, what, when, how did that happen? What caused that? We, you know, I still don't know. Mm -hmm. and, and again, it goes back to this thing of, you know, the, the, the thing about these being private companies and outside auditors or engineers were having no access. So we don't know what actually happened mm -hmm. inside there. And I think that is, you know, really, really problematic. When you uh, gave your TED talk and you addressed uh, the gods of tech directly, um, you, you asked them if they wanted to be remembered as the handmaidens of autocracy or handmaidens of authoritarianism. Um, it was a very striking moment. And I want to ask, um, why do you, how do you feel the complex of things we're talking about feed directly into authoritarianism? It's just, I mean, it, it, I mean it's just so striking isn't it, I think, that if you just look at so many countries across the world, we see these strongmen, populist authoritarians um, who have come to power and who have come to power in the new age of political campaigning, uh, which has been enabled by these tech platforms. And I think, you know, we come back to the thing of actually truth doesn't spread virally on the internet. Lies spread virally. And the thing that is most popular is the hate, hate you know, the, the hate and fear mongering. And that is the thing that seems to be provoking people to click and to, um, you, you know, support that message. So, you know, I don't know the answer to that question, but... Mm -hmm we can see that this is happening all across the world. And it is, you know, striking, I think, and scary that um, I think we've all witnessed it. You know, we're living through this moment, aren't we? We saw that. You saw that in America with Trump, that that just drowned out the evidence-based reporting and <coughs> factual information. I mean that just doesn't really work anymore. You know, it is, truth is under, completely under assault. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why we're sort of so lost as journalists, as journalism, because it just, journalism doesn't work in the old way. Mm -hmm. And you can't really hold anybody or anything to account 
just by publishing the truth. Um, and, you know, that's why, you know, sort of really <laughs> deep thinking, I think, is required, which is why I'm very glad that Berkeley, <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> there's people here who are thinking about these things, I hope. Um, uh, <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> no That's all of you. No pressure. I'm reminded, um, as you're talking just now, of attending a great many Trump rallies, as I did <laughs> in the last election cycle, and um, how much visceral fun fear is. How much more entertaining the Trump rallies were uh, than the Clinton rallies. Um, what an entertaining figure he, Trump can be and how uh, invigorating it is to yell against the other, to yell, lock her up, or build that wall, of course, which was all about the kind of enthusiasm of hatred. And uh, maybe we're, you know, Plato obviously had this problem 2,500 years ago with democracy, he basically treated it as mobocracy. You know, that uh, what excites the mob should not be what governs us. But it seems to have taken us 2,500 years to get to Facebook to translate somehow in this dark, secret, heavily funded way hatred into votes. That would I mean you put that much better than I could have. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're going to open this in a minute uh, uh, to questions. And we have uh, uh, microphones, I think, um, floating around. Uh, we will have them. But, you know, while, while the questions are lining up, I want to ask you, um, you, you evinced a, a charming naivete a moment ago about putting something in a newspaper and then people being shocked and things change. I used to think that too. We still teach our students that. Um, what exactly has happened to you personally since you started putting these things into the newspaper when it comes to uh, the gods of tech? Uh, well, I mean, it's kind. Of, I mean, one of the things, one of the things about writing about like disinformation and propaganda and using, you know, the tech platforms to do so is that you do become a subject of disinformation and propaganda and trolling and hate speech and misogyny and violent threats. And, you know, the great, the whole suite of them, it's like, it's that, um, you know, that is part of, 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 of um, trying to report on these things. And um, I don't know. I mean, I kind of, I sort of worry about it. I especially worry about it in terms of young journalists, actually, because I sort of think, oh, I don't want, you know, young women to kind of think, oh, well, who wants to be called a crazy cat lady? I think I might go and do something <laughs> slightly less, you know, sort of different instead. And I'm always, I'm always I, you know, I was, I was sort of, I was saying today is that actually the, um, I, I find that actually for most of the young people I talk to, they say actually it's this thing of going out and fighting and trying to stand up to these things is, um, um, they don't seem to be being put off, which pleases me because it's, mm -hmm. There's, there's some definite downsides, it has to be said. You've been, you've been sued or threatened to uh, be sued, sued a couple yeah, of times. Yeah, that as well. Yeah, that's pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to make that's sure we bad. got that in. Yeah. Yeah, that's not great. It wasn't just the mad cat woman of Brexit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, questions? I'll let the mics find you. First... I have to say, we have to remember that Mr. Trump lost the popular vote by three million. I've been very disturbed that the media talks about Trump winning all the time. By very careful calculation, he managed to get the Electoral College he calculation did, he did and all the other stuff. But he lost the popular vote. And I went to a, a Sanders rally in Missoula, Montana, the field house filled, and there was a joyousness. So I, I question your saying that Trump rallies are fun, because somehow the fear is fun. I don't know. I think they're really horrifying. 
to see people who've so lost their power to assess reality. But, so I'm not really asking a question, but I feel like we need to remember that man okay. did not win. Que questions? Hello? Okay, yes. there we go. Okay, um, what I wanted to ask is that you seem to see this really big push, like you said, behind authoritarians in terms of technology, but we haven't really seen any similar push f b like for either your sort of status quo warriors or other figures in politics. Like you look at Cambridge Analytica and, and the massive amount of, of effect that they were able to have on our democracy, whereas the Democratic Party can't even get their Iowa app to work. So I'm asking, I guess, wh why is it that we see specifically so much of this support in technology being used for poor means on the right? Good question. I mean, I think it was the, I mean, I think, I mean, if you look at Bannon, you know, so Steve Bannon was a, vice president of Cambridge Analytica, and it was funded by Robert Mercer. And, you know, they spent a long time thinking about these problems, and because they considered the mainstream media so liberal, and, um, and you know, their message wasn't getting through. So I mm -hmm. think they think, I think they, they thought long and hard about how to, you know, how to create an alternate new system and, and also how to um, feed their stories into um, the existing mainstream media and how to invest in technology. And I th just think they were kind of like on it earlier. But, you know, you can see that there are, you know, there are on the now, there are Democrats who are deciding to do the same thing. You know, there's that, well, we, we have to play mm. them at their own game. And I think there's a real debate over actually the ethics of that but there is a kind of you could say a structural advantage in the tearing down side right i mean yeah. the kind of ripping it apart burning it down that's kind of the structural it's not really ideological per se mm, it's mm, ripping it out mm, mm. or destroying it but i mean you know the really troubling thing which i'm sure you're all aware of is that you know this 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 there is you know, the, in terms of what's next for America, in terms of this election, in terms of the things which will impact it, this one decision by one man, Mark Zuckerberg, to um, allow micro-targeted ads were containing massive lies um, is, you, you know, it, it just has such consequences. And we also see him you know, having secret dinners with mm. Donald Trump and Peter Thiel. And, you know, there is an alignment there, it seems, of interest. It's mm. sort of, I don't really, I mean, I don't know, I'd be interested to see what other people think about it. But, you know, I find that really troubling. What would be the, I mean, if Zuckerberg was sitting here and you uh, could make a proposal to him, about, I mean, how would you deal with that problem? Assuming that he wanted to solve it, of course, which is a large assumption, but uh, would there be people who would look at the ads and judge them for truth, or? It's just, you know what I would do? So this is, this is, this is, this is, I mean, I, I do not ban political ads. I mean, I mean, there, there, is no, there is no constitutional right to pay for micro-targeted political advertisements. I don't think there is that constitutional amendment in the United States, is there? You know, and this ridiculous argument that he gives about, you know, free speech, it has nothing to do with free, free speech. It is paid for hate speech. Mm -hmm. I mean, and the fact that America imposes this on the rest of the world when, you know, cultures where this is so dangerous and so harmful is, um, you know, spectacularly irresponsible. You know, we've seen the effects of that in places like Myanmar. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, you know, it's the, 
the, you know, the ethical consequences of these actions have not been reckoned with. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, is that there are people sitting not very many miles away from here who are directly responsible for the deaths of thousands of people. You know, according to the United Nations, you know, it's not journalists who are saying that. That's a United Nations report. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, you know, I, it's, it's, it's incredibly alarming. You know, what we're seeing in India in the last couple of days is incredibly alarming. We know that WhatsApp in India was a huge source of um, dis and misinformation that mm -hmm. was uh, inflaming um, r racial tensions there. Mm -hmm. It would be, of course, uh, the Supreme Court has treated political uh, uh, purchases of advertisement as speech. I mean, it would have to be, uh, there would either have to be an amendment or another Supreme Court decision that or would they reverse could, that. Or Facebook could just decide to step out, you know, it could just go, yeah. oh, you know what, actually, we'll sit this one out, you just carry on as you were. <laughs> you know, like, why not buy a couple of billboards? <laughs> you know, or, you know, it's, it didn't, we didn't have this machinery, you know, mm -hmm. a decade ago. And um, there is no God-given right to using it now. And the fact that it's the micro-targeting that is so pernicious. So the ability to direct it at individuals based upon this secretive data that you no idea where it comes from. That, you know, mm -hmm. there is no rational explanation as to why we must allow the political campaigns to have access to that. Mm -hmm. Question. Uh, two, two things. First, thank you so much for your reporting and your courage to continue. The, the question I have, two separate ones. First is, to what extent do you believe that Russian influence affected Brexit or other elections? And secondly, is this all evil, or people were saying the, uh, the Arab Spring was partly benefited from all this? So I apologize for two questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you both. Um, so the second one first is that that's right. I mean, I think we're all, we, were all, we were all very naive, I think. And we, we, none of us saw the consequences of this. So I think that's completely you know, correct to say that you know, there are m many fantastic, wonderful things that have come out of this technology. And um, we couldn't see around corners. But now we have the facts. You know, now that is not true. Now the, the, the visible um, effects of it are, um, should be, you know, available to us all. So that argument does not stand. And that is why um, I think the complete absence of, you know, moral responsibility from Facebook is... Um, you, you know, so appalling. And if I, you know, the, the question about Russian interference in Brexit is really interesting because um, we're in this situation at the moment whereby our parliament um, commissioned a report into exactly that subject, into Russian interference in our politics. And um, it took evidence for more than a year from the experts. It had um, evidence from the security services, from MI5 and from MI6. And that report was supposed to come out before our general election, the general election that decided the future of our country because they got the majority to carry out uh, Brexit. And um, Boris Johnson personally suppressed the publication of that report. And um, we still don't know if and when it will come out, and we don't know if it's going to come out in the, that form. And, um, but we do know there is all sorts of evidence um, about Russian money in uh, UK politics. Mm -hmm. And um, in particular, one of my um, special subjects, which is... Um, a businessman who funded Brexit, who is now suing me um, because I reported upon a series of secret meetings that he had at the Russian embassy in London in um, the week that they launched the uh, Brexit campaign, and at which we discovered he was offered these gold and diamond deals. And... Um, <laughs> 
He was the biggest funder of Brexit. He's the biggest political donor in British history. And um, we don't know where that money came from. And um, Aaron Banks uh, has responded to this scrutiny by taking a lawsuit out against me. So mm -hmm. that's where we are with it. <laughs> <laughs> Question from students. Um, hi. Uh, so I brought this up uh, before, but I really want to delve uh, deeper into it. Um, my name is Gisela. I'm from Mexico, a journalism student. We've met. Um, but the most critical circles in Latin America point to the willingness of um, US-based people and Anglo-Saxon people to blame technology for inherently problematic and racist behavior in their society. Um, so what do you think about this argument and how much is this similar to the techno-solutionism that, we, that I know that you and I both criticize, and for the rest of the audience, techno-solutionism, meaning uh, there's a lot of poverty in the world, let's make an app to b fix poverty. What are the causes? I don't know, but an app will fix it. So I wonder, and it's not saying that I don't agree with everything you've said, but I wonder how much of that are we mirroring instead of seeing technology as merely an extension of human behavior? So, <laughs> Gisela, I, think, I feel that you would answer that much better than I would. <laughs> what do you think? I don't know. Um, I think it's a very complex, I think it's a very complex question. And I, I just, we're in the middle of deciding, right? And we're in the middle of debating all these grand things and all the future that is ahead of us and ahead of me as a 30-year-old journalism student. Um, so I just, I just wonder, I can't stop thinking about fix, like throwing in apps to fix democracy, AKA Iowa, right? So how much of that is going on in here and how much of that is taking us away? Well, we have, in, in Britain, we have this incredibly sophisticated technology that we use for ballots and mm. it's called um, pen and paper. And um, it's, um, it's, it's, it's very sophisticated and they have actual people who count the bits of pen and paper. <laughs> and um, my sister, well, she, was a vo she, she did it during the last election and you stay up there all night and you count the bits of paper and then they recount it and then they recount it and then we have a result. And I don't know, it just sort of seems like, maybe, <laughs> can I just offer that out for free? <laughs> <laughs> Question. Over here. Uh, yes, hello. My question is about, um, earlier you described how we're in this sort of moment of stasis because we know that a crime has been committed, but we don't have the evidence. And we know that the old values are old assumptions that if you put the truth out there, something will happen, the needle will move. That no longer applies. So I guess my question is, how long before this window of stasis closes and the time to act sort of closes because, just to take another counterexample, um, in torture prosecutions, for example, when they've done studies how you have about a window of about five to eight years after torture or war crimes have been discovered for a society to begin initiating prosecutions, and if they don't do it, then effectively it becomes normalized, mm -hmm. just becomes part of the way that the government does business. So what I'm asking is, how much time is there how, what, and what is the window of time, did you say? How many in legal years? circles, it says it's about five to eight years. So, so for example, I we don't that, talk I about... I find that incredibly depressing because, um, um, you know, and you feel it. I mean, you, there, I, you know, there, exactly, there is a window of time. And, you know, I, when I was at... Um, when I gave that talk at TED afterwards, um, they, they had um, Roger McNamee, who you may know, who was one of the... Um, um, early investors in Facebook mm -hmm. gave this uh, talk. Guilty. And, and I, I was kind of making this... Anyway, I, I asked a question from the floor, and it was... The, the point about it was, was that I was sort of saying that the, like, the whole thing is, is that in Brexit, what we really need is we just need the evidence, you know? 
So at the moment, the evidence of what happened is closed off to us because it's still inside the private company. And I was sort of saying, we need to, you know, the point, we kind of need like a governmental inquiry, but that's never going to happen because the government was involved. So that's not going to happen. So it's kind of, I was sort of saying, well, we need, you know, we need like a sort of truth inquiry. And, um, and somebody else in the audience then sort of said, well, he, and he sort of said, well, I set up the, he's, he set up the, one of the people who was involved in setting up the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And, you know, he said this is exactly, he, he sort of said this is what we need. We do need, you know, we need to establish truth and we need to get that evidence and we need to, like, make that case uh, to the companies. And, but it's like, how do we do this? It's the mechanisms, you know, it requires the sort of mm -hmm. body to take this on. But it's just, as I said, if we, if we don't do that, if we, can't, if we can't establish a template of actually discovering what is going on in our elections, in elections all across the world, then it just, you know, I, I just, it just seems like such a recipe for disaster. And, you know, going to the very basics about this, which is that, you know, our elections, so fundamental to our societies in all these different countries, but it, this, it, the, the information, it just needs to be part of a kind of public commons. You know, it cannot be held by private mm -hmm. companies. You know, that is just, it just seems so basic. But, you know, at the moment, we don't have anybody or any, you know, organisation making that case. And, um, and, you know, you're right. Is that, is it, you know, is it just going to slip into history as an injustice that was committed? And... Um, I think that if that is the case, that the injustices are just going to carry on being committed. It and also, I find that, you know, really very alarming. It also delegitimizes, obviously, the electoral process. If you had a close election, for example, this year, and people have been speculating that Trump, in the event of a close election, would be very hard to dislodge, the legitimacy itself of the election... Uh, is already being undermined ahead of time, not only by what we know about, but by the news reporting itself on, you know, what you're doing, in effect, too. Well, and also, even just this question of, like, you know, the Russian ads on Facebook mm -hmm. in the 2016 election. I mean, all, the only thing that Facebook handed over was ads which were paid for in... Um, ads which were paid for in rubles <laughs> in Russia... <laughs> and it's kind of like if, if somebody had the brilliant idea of paying in dollars <laughs> in America, like, you know, that, that, that is completely undetected and, and, and you know, um, will be undetected again. Uh, we have time for one more. One more question. So um, we're, the older I get, the more I recognize our silos, especially Sorry, where in the, this media uh, landscape. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're all on the same page here. We have media literacy. We're probably not rich. Not very many of us are rich. Um, we care. We believe in evidence. And I'd like you to talk about, can you talk about what you're optimistic about, what we as individuals can do? Because, you know, I'm sure a lot of us have deleted Facebook, but that doesn't matter. What do we do about the silos? Well, I mean, I, I kind of absolutely think that the answer has to come from the people and I think it's only when this subject reaches the mainstream and when there is that, this awareness of, of, you know, how we are being manipulated, the monopolistic power, the, the, you know, the, the control that is being exerted, that, that, you know, we can have effective change. And I found it really interesting. I've really enjoyed being in Berkeley for the last few days because... Um, I really feel that like this is the place where which should be leading in terms in this subject is that you you have the proximity you have the geographical location you have access to the tech companies in a way which we in the rest of the world don't have and you have the history of um, you know coming up with the ideas and um, and going against the grain so I actually do feel a kind of like spark of hope here. You have these brilliant minds all around the university. Um, and I just hope that there's some means of bringing those together and thinking really hard about these questions. And um, so that's my 
that's my bit of optimism, I'd say. What a gracious note to leave us. Hello. <laughs> Can I, sorry about this. Can I just have two minutes? Teaching a course, uh, Media and Democracy, we have 291 students. And I started with your video. Oh. And they're, they're all here. Oh. They're here. And uh, we, we wanted you to come and talk to us. But it's really, I, I wanted to talk about this idea of a uh, younger generation. You know, Brexit was a... Uh, uh, much more the older generation. And I think, you know, like most people, the level of hope looking at India, looking at UK and USA, I'm part of all these three nations, so to speak. And so can you say something about this idea of common good and the younger generation and what hope we... I mean, you talked a little bit about this. But yeah, yeah, I mean, I really do. I really do think it is going to take a kind of we the people moment. And... Um, um, you, you know, I, I, but that's where it's kind of journalism and the, you know, the young people in the audience are so key, I think, to understanding this. I think they already natively understand it far better than us older people and, and can see the pernicious effects of the social media platforms in their own life. And so, yeah, I do think that they, they are the solution and um, so, you know, no pressure, but <laughs> over to you. <laughs> so, let, me, let me close. I, I'm going to invite some more applause in a moment. Let me close by uh, thanking uh, Esther Wojcicki for inspiring this week. And, and Shana Penn and Toby Philanthropies for making it possible. I want to also mention the people who actually did the work, Marlena Telvik, uh, Julie Hirano, <laughs> Sam Goldman. And a shout, out, a shout out to Deirdre English, who did a great deal about shaping this week into a very thoughtful and, and, and exciting time. And of course, Mark Danner, did, as usual, splendidly on stage, and Carol, you're amazing. It's, it's such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. <laughs>